Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melis, and on behalf of Kerasoft, I would like to welcome you to our CHOOCH webinar, AI Vision, Detect and Prevent Forest Fires to Secure National Parks. To tell you a little bit about Kerasoft, we are a trusted IT solutions provider delivering software and support solutions to the federal, state, local, and education customers. Kerasoft maintains dedicated team support, sales, and marketing for all of its vendors. Our contact information will be at the end of the presentation, so please do not to, please do not hesitate to call or email us for any of your needs. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today's presentation: Brett Rudenstein, VP of Engineering and Services from Vantique; Michael Lee Yu, President of Corporate Strategy from Chooch; and Rob Silverberg. Chief Technology and Innovation Strategist for SLG from Dell. With that, I would like to turn it over to our speakers of the day, Brett, Michael, and Rob. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Melis. Um, great to have everyone uh, have you here today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Michael Liu, and I am the president heading up corporate strategy and development. Uh, my key role here at Chooch is to kind of forge these enterprise uh, like uh, relationships and partnerships. We have 70. We're proud to count Kerasoft, Dell, and Vantec as partners. And the goal is to deliver computer vision solutions and uh, all the aspects related to computer vision to our end customers and partners. Uh, with that, I hand over to Brett. Thanks, Michael. Uh, hi, everyone. Brett Rudenstein, Vice President of Solutions Architecture for Vantec. I've been with Vantec for six and a half years, uh, coming up on seven really quickly, nearly 25 years uh, in the industry. And uh, my role at Vantic is to help our customers, our uh, various prospects of Vantic, as well as our partners understand our technology, how that uh, offering helps them in their endeavors or, uh, as it pertains to real-time streaming uh, applications uh, and help them implement those solutions as well. Over to you, uh, Rob. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Rob Silverberg with Dell Technologies. I am the Chief Technology and Innovation Strategist focused on our state and local government customers. Uh, our team is uh, designed to help understand key challenges and needs in state and local government, and then how we can innovate and uh, collaborate with our partners on bringing new and innovative solutions to uh, to those customers. So what you're going to hear about today is, is the result of one of those collaborations, and I'm very excited about it. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, on the, uh, the the way this uh, webinar is going to roll is uh, we'll each of us kind of present uh, for about five minutes about our respective companies and technologies and the solutions that they bring. Uh, we'll go into a little bit deeper dive related to the uh, public sector and land management and the risks and how AI can uh, potentially address some of these risks. And then lastly, uh, jump into uh, the meat of it, which is why we're all here, which is about how can we combine our technologies to uh, address and detect uh, wildfires, which is a pretty big problem. Uh, with that, let me uh, share screen. So let me kick it off. Uh, Chooch is an AI company uh, deploying computer vision. Uh, we were founded about uh, six plus years ago. And our goal is to replicate human visual intelligence into AI models. Our journey first started with object, classic object detection and image classification. We then started adding additional capabilities with behavior detection, like loitering or falling down, suspicious behavior. Uh, we then kind of morphed uh, and continue to build ensemble models, which are multiple models that are actually working together. Uh, and then uh, we then jumped into the fray with uh, uh, with generative AI, where our teams have been research researching this for well over a year and actually now deploying generative AI, which you'll see in action uh, later today. Uh, our AI processes uh, both images and video. Uh, it runs both uh, in the cloud and on the edge. And it is a horizontal platform and flexible and is ready now, meaning that we have a number of different solutions that can be deployed uh, immediately today. Our focus uh, primarily has been on federal and public sector, but we've also done uh, deployments related to smart city, smart spaces, public safety, manufacturing retail, and geospatial. You can call our technology a dual use uh, technology where there's application both in the uh, public federal sector as well as uh, commercial. Uh, the role of edge computing uh, continues to uh, uh, take a uh, grow, grow uh, more and more um, in critical in nature only because 90% of existing data, which is mostly video, has been generated literally in the last two years. And most of that is unstructured. 
So the idea of edge computing is to deploy the AI where the data is actually being generated. This could be on video feeds uh, in the field, uh, images. Uh, they could be generated from uh, multiple um, platforms, whether it be drones, uh, robot dogs. Uh, it could be uh, servers in the field. Uh, and this is critical. This is critical for low latency, high availability, and mission-critical tasks. Now, a lot of three-letter agencies might come to mind when you think about these requirements, but there are a lot of civilian type of applications related to FEMA and National Guard and deployment of resources where areas uh, that are may, uh, may be at risk uh, post-hurricane, uh, post-tornado, uh, post-wildfire. Uh, uh, edge computing also addresses uh, data privacy issues and protection and gravity, and is very, very important in areas where you're maybe in a, a comms night environment where you may not have connectivity, 5G, 4G, or even uh, 3G. And costs typically are a function of models, the number of models that we're running in the wild, uh, cameras, scale, high availability, and uh, latency. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a multiple uh, ways of deploying our AI. Uh, currently, our infrastructure is partially in AWS and actually partially in Azure right now. So you can certainly use the Chooch cloud for a compute. We also have the ability to run in other third-party clouds you know, provided by Azure, AWS, GPC, or your own private cloud. And then lastly, you can also run, as I mentioned, uh, on-premise uh, to kind of address some of the issues that I uh, addressed. Uh, we've also deployed on uh, tanks, helicopters, drones, robot dogs, uh, you name it. Essentially, if you point us to where the GPU is, we can run our AI. Uh, we've developed a number of solutions addressing uh, smart spaces. When I say smart spaces or smart X, I'm talking about cities, state, land management, stadiums, public transit, et cetera. Uh, and with our partners here, we've developed a number of different solutions addressing these, ranging from fire and smoke detection to uh, crowd analysis, uh, weapons and threat detection, uh, issues related to perimeter security, uh, public transit incidents, uh, vehicles of interest, and even uh, traffic analysis. So just to uh, summarize, before I head off to uh, Brett, we're a horizontal platform where we can develop uh, custom models, those already now models. We are no code, uh, and we can create and deploy anywhere. Uh, integration is fairly easy. I like to say that Vantic, is one, who is one of our partners, able to integrate within, I believe, 18 hours upon our first meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, our AI can process images and video, um, both in a physical as well as vir uh, virtual um, uh, world. And as I mentioned earlier, we can really deploy uh, anywhere. No vendor lock, multi-cloud compatible, and we are now deploying generative AI to actually increase accuracy and tackle some of the more challenging abstract problems, which I'll uh, dig into a little bit deeper in the presentation. Uh, so with that, let me hand it over to my colleague, uh, Brett. Thanks, uh, Michael. Let me uh, bring up my screen here. Are you seeing, are you seeing the entire screen? If someone can, hopefully you're seeing the slides. Yes, indeed. Looks good. I appreciate that. Uh, so in, in short, uh, I'll give you a quick background on Vantic. At some point, we're going to uh, get into a demonstration of uh, the combined solution offering, but uh, We'll start off with what Vantic is, and Vantic at its core is a rapid innovation platform for building what you would call real-time event-driven applications. And the goal of the platform is to sit at the intersection of streaming sources, other systems, and the people that interact with them to arrive at very specific business outcomes. And that is the ability to take in those real-time streams of data. So in sort of, if we sort of break it apart into its constituent pieces, the platform is designed to sense, analyze, and act on real-time streams of data. We talk about the first one, we talk about bring, being able to bring data into the platform. We're talking about being able to bring it in from anywhere. So we will listen to various streams of data using popular PubSub methodologies. So we can listen to MQTT, Kafka, Google Cloud PubSub, whatever that might be. Uh, we can listen down at the edge to, for example, uh, TCP or UDP stream. Obviously, uh, in many instances, we're integrating with an AI engine, uh, for example, like uh, like Chooch. 
Uh, Chooch is uh, one of our premier partners in this space. And what that offers us the ability to do is to take in those streams. And we can get it from a number of different ways. We'll pull, pull that in uh, through their Kafka endpoints. We'll pull, a, pull it in through their API REST endpoints. Uh, the short of it is to say that there's always a way to bring data into the platform. Uh, Vantic is a low-code and uh, a low-code, no-code platform, and it's designed to allow you to rapidly build up these what I'll call discrete situations of interest. Those things that represent opportunities or threats in a stream of data. And so, this middle area, the analysis phase that you see in the middle, is where we sort of look for those situations of interest. Here we provide a number of what we call activity patterns. These are low code out of the box activity patterns that allow you to stream or string together the various streams of data to provide or to gain that context or that situational awareness. And one of the things that Vantic is particularly good at doing is performing a form of sensor fusion. And that is taking multiple different streams of data, joining them in a window of time to identify that, that contextual uh, awareness, if you will. So imagine, if you will, that you have the AI engine looking for two cars that are close together, maybe even touching bumpers that represent, uh, for example, a, a crash of some kind. Um, then potentially you have an audio engine that is listening for the sound of the crash. And while each of them may or may not be that actual thing, maybe the sound is, uh, maybe the sound is a backfire or a crash, maybe the, the image is two cars just touching bumpers or a crash, by contextualizing both of those in a window of time, you can analyze them for that you know, sort of situational awareness. And then the last mile of the platform is designed around action or maybe better said as business outcome. And that is the ability to do the first two things, the ability to sense and analyze in context of that problem in which to capitalize on the opportunity or to mitigate the threat, if you will. And so this is very different than traditional, you know, like a traditional workflow uh, system where things are done in perfect contiguous order. Uh, you can think of, you know, a, a, a standard business flow where maybe you OCR something and then you redact it and then you email it off to somebody. Uh, those are very concrete steps. But in systems like these, you have to be able to take the next best real time action to arrive at the optimal business outcome. That is, you have to be able to, again, continue to sense and analyze in context of that issue. Uh, for example, the canonical example might be uh, uh, an, an, an Uber ride, where if the driver is going in the wrong way, your opportunities become a threat. Or if there's traffic, you have to route around it. So the system's designed to take in those streams of data from vision, uh, from environmental factors, and combine them into situational awareness. All of that is well and good, but they have to meet the stringent requirements that are necessary for building real-time applications. And so Vantic applications from the ground up are event-driven by their very nature. It's built on a completely event-driven architecture designed for the velocity, the variety and volume of data that might be ingested into it. It is built with mission critical attributes in mind. These are the typical, what I would call the illities of software development. So you can think of these as reliability, availability, scalability, securability, and so forth. When we think about scalability, we think about the two dimensions, the traditional horizontal and vertical. Vantic creates a third dimension of scalability in distribution. Architecturally, Vantic is a peer-to-peer -peer architecture that makes it so that you can define applications that run in the cloud, that run in the edge and any combination they're in, you get to define the application logic. And that's really what we're doing in this, in this uh, wildfire situation is orchestrating events between various kinds of edge situations between the AI engines and providing the appropriate workflow capabilities therein. And the last is that they are collaborative, that humans oftentimes make the final decision in which to provide decisioning information and that each downstream recipient, whether that's human, machine, or otherwise, gets to take that next best real-time action. We put that all inside of a single platform that is, as I mentioned, it is low-code, no-code. It is designed for performance and scalability. It can run on the cloud at the edge, makes it super easy to integrate with other systems, and is event-driven by, uh, by, uh, by its fundamental architecture. Uh, we're going to obviously do a demo in a short while, but uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Sounds good. Thank you, Brett. Uh, very interesting info on Vantic and 
Very happy to have both Vantic and Chooch as our partners in this innovative project. Um, so a little bit about Dell. Most people know uh, Dell Technologies. We make laptops, desktops, and, and other computer equipment. But what most people don't know is the breadth and depth of scale in terms of technology and innovation and really uh, leveraging technology to improve outcomes, to innovate, to create new solutions. So part of my focus and the focus of my team is building those new solutions and innovating. Uh, so that's a key fun fundamental word that, uh, that you're going to hear me use. Uh, here at Dell Technologies, we create technologies that drive human progress. So a computer is a computer, but when a computer is used to improve uh, the way our society operates, the way traffic flows, the way fires are fought, the way the way organizations operate, that is where we see the true value is, is in driving those outcomes and in driving human progress. The way we do that is uh, through accelerating ideas to innovation. So this could this project actually started over a lunch and a discussion of the art of the possible. And then we, we assembled the right team, we got the right technology in place, and we worked to deliver those outcomes in terms of improving the ability to respond and react to potential fires. The focus areas for Dell uh, are across this, this, this board here. We're focused on the future of work. We're focused on making multi-cloud simpler for uh, our customers to adopt. We're working on modern data infrastructure so you can make intelligent actions related to data. We're very focused on edge and IoT and AI, which is a lot of the focus we'll talk about here today. And of course, everything needs to be protected. So you have to deploy these solutions with an eye towards cybersecurity and cyber resilience. Um, as we innovate and as we determine where to focus as an organization, we have our core, which is around uh, the core elements of, of PC and compute and networking storage. However, the growth areas and the areas where Dell is investing a lot of time, energy, personnel, uh, and, and, and research is in the evolving new technologies of edge and 5G and AI and ML. And, and cloud operations. So as we look to grow and as we look to invest in areas that we believe will benefit our society going forward, those are the growth areas that we are focused on. And how we do it and how we get there is really around an ecosystem. It's uh, identifying the right players, bringing the right players to the table to work with us on a potential solution. That is what we did in this case. We brought together Chooch and Vantic and other partners, and we created a collaboration with, with the fire department and a, uh, a fire uh, camera system. And with that uh, ecosystem, we were able to collaborate and we were able to jointly drive a solution that we'll talk about in just a minute. So as we look to where we're going in the future, you know, really what is our next innovation idea? And can we take something that started you know, as an idea over lunch and actually build a solution that will be potentially valuable to uh, our country, our nation, and, and maybe even broader than that? So with that, I will turn it over to Michael. Oops, hold on, soft share, there we go. That's the right button. All right, thanks so much, Rob. So um, let's just dive right in here. Um, we are uh, at the very end. We'll be talking. We'll be actually showing you uh, a demo, but uh, a little bit of background. Um, so when we started on this uh, discussion and project, we realized that there were a lot of applications and scenarios uh, where uh, we have other types of risks in these large areas uh, beyond just uh, wildfire. And so if you take a look at land management as a whole, whether it be at the federal, state, or a local level. Uh, or if you, uh, and we're talking about national parks, uh, we're talking about forests, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are very, very vast areas, right? They're very sparsely populated, uh, very limited staffing. I was actually at Joshua Tree just a few weeks ago, um, seven hours of hiking, walking around. Yes, there were some tourists around, saw two rangers, that was it. So if someone had a fall, um, if uh, if there was a, uh, a fire uh, that was smoldering, uh, I'm not quite sure what the alert system would be like, be able to kind of manage that type of risk. Uh, because of scale and size, um, a lot of these areas are inaccessible, which makes rendering aid logistically uh, challenging. So imagine using computer vision uh, deployed either uh, with fixed cameras or perhaps via drone, uh, which I know some parks are doing right now, or even satellite, and being able to help identify and address those risks. Uh, computer vision will provide that type of scale uh, and certainly speed. 
and accuracy. So as opposed to saying, uh, I think I saw a fire over there. Uh, what direction? Not quite sure. How big is it? Mm, not quite sure. Do you see a lot of smoke? Mm -hmm. We actually can pinpoint that. And with the demo that we are going to show you later today, uh, because we understand where these cameras are and the accuracy that the AI can provide, we can actually pinpoint uh, those risks. And as I mentioned, you know, if done correctly, uh, we can generate rapid insights and therefore deploy aid and resources on, on a timely basis. Some of the use cases that we've encountered in dealing with the state and local governments related to what land management, uh, we're currently talking to the state of New York. Uh, they're looking to detect activity on lakes and waterways uh, using artificial intelligence. With a couple cities within California, uh, we've been asked to, to, to uh, use AI to uh, early detection of illegal encampments uh, for public safety. Uh, with um, the city of Las Vegas, uh, they're interested in using AI to kind of monitor parks, anything from occupancy usage all the way all the way to campsite security, making sure that you know fires are not uh, 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 unattended, if you will. Um, but there's a lot that goes into managing these properties, the so land management, um, maintenance, um, making sure there's no debris out there. Uh, vegetation encroachment has been a pretty big deal uh, lately, uh, especially with all the wildfires that we've seen, uh, particularly in California. And of course, detecting uh, wildfires early is the, is the primary reason why we're all here today. Um, detection is critical, right? And I think uh, uh, it's pretty obvious that um, the risks are rising. Right, with rising temperatures and droughts and weather patterns and fuel load. As a matter of fact, um, you know, because of the huge amount of rain that California received uh, this year, there are going to be a lot more higher risks because there's a lot more vegetation that has, uh, has, uh, that has grown. 60% uh, of the fires here are actually uh, man-made right, through arson, uh, vehicles, uh, power lines, uh, campfires. And one of the big issues in California is this vegetation management coupled with an overloaded grid and then power line maintenance. And so we can use AI to potentially do everything from vegetation encroachment to potential uh, corrosion uh, issues related to power lines. And uh, this could certainly be done from not only a fixed camera perspective, uh, but also uh, using, using drones to kind of uh, get into more hard or difficult uh, access areas. Uh, burn area and severity uh, only continues to rise here. And uh, if for those of you who are in the Bay Area in 2020, um, you might remember some of those very, very, very orange days. Where we had a lot of smoke and fire. Uh, five of the worst days of air pollution in history were in 2020. And the fires were very, very severe uh, that year. And this impacts everybody, right? Not only the government, but utilities, insurance companies, uh, et cetera. And 2020 was a pretty bad year for California, 33 million acres of forest of which over 10% burned. Just under 10,000 wildfires happened that year with $19 billion worth of losses and where we spend over $2 billion in firefighting costs. And if you combine 2020 and 2021 together, uh, we burned more area than the previous seven years combined. So, uh, as I mentioned, there are different ways to kind of tackle this, right? We can use satellite imagery, uh, which we have uh, worked on here at Chooch. We can use certainly uh, drones, and, and people are even now contemplating using uh, balloons. But here, we're actually uh, here to discuss the solution that we came up with in collaboration using a fixed camera network. And we actually entered into a pilot with uh, Kern County and Alert California. Uh, and as a result, we uh, basically tapped into their network of uh, cameras. Now, in order to kind of accomplish this, we had to kind of uh, tinker with our AI a little bit. Um, what you see here is an actual image uh, from uh, one of the cameras. You'll see uh, a lot of land, you see a lot of clouds. And we developed a ready now uh, fire and smoke AI model to actually detect uh, smoke on the ground. Uh, these are pre-trained using pre-annotated data. Uh, and we kind of fine tuned this uh, through a feedback mechanism where if we saw any false positives or false negatives, they were used to actually uh, fine tune this model. However, um, fire and smoke are one of those more abstract, uh, difficult abstractions for AI to actually uh, pinpoint. And what I mean by abstractions are that if you're building a model to identify a cat or a dog or um, a car, those are fairly straightforward. But things like debris, trash, corrosion, smoke and fire, auto accidents, dents, these are a little bit more intractable. So we then 
decided to actually start using uh, a generative AI approach to complement our object detection model. And what this um, generative AI model, uh, we call it uh, image chat, which you can actually download from the Apple Store or uh, Google Play, is actually a fusion of a large language model, um, a transformer-based query model, and our computer vision model, where we have over 400 million images and 11 billion parameters here. And we decided to integrate uh, prompt engineering to actually utilize um, the best of both worlds here. And why is that? It's because although we see with our eyes and they can identify, we communicate in language. So we ended up developing this super model called image chat to actually deal with some of these more challenging abstractions within computer vision. And so literally once the ready now uh, model on the left-hand side localizes what it thinks it may see smoke or fire, it interacts with our generative model to little, with a prompt that really say, is there smoke or fire? And right there, you can see on a lower right-hand side, which is practically impossible for a human to identify, we've actually correctly identified um, uh, some smoke uh, for the em emanating from a, a wildfire. And we call this a prompt engineering. So um, before I hand it over uh, to uh, both Rob and Brett, I just kind of want to walk you through uh, some of the highlights from the pilot here. Uh, we all collaborated with Kern County and Alert, uh, well, Alert California's network of 1,000 cameras that were provided by PG&E, San Diego Gas Electric, SoCal Edison, Cal Fire, and other sponsors. And these cameras are currently monitored by personnel. It's time consuming. And what we learned from the uh, fire chiefs and, and fire researchers that actually requires some very specific subject matter expertise. And, um, but as the number of cameras grow, uh, obviously monitoring becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, we've also heard of other solutions out there uh, to potentially uh, monitor this, uh, but unfortunately there are too many natural phenomena. Things like cloud, mist, fog, marine layer, even a dirty camera lens that ends up generating too many false positives to be productive. And as a result, actually slowed production. So what the team here did was uh, basically access the API into the Alert California camera network. Uh, we are calling the API every 15 minutes and grabbing an image from each of those thousand cameras. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are that we take those images and we run it through the Choose Ready Now smoke and fire model, plus the generative AI model inferencing on the NVIDIA A100 GPU. Uh, and then we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a feedback mechanism to also deal with false positive negatives. With the power of generative AI, we were able to drop the number of false positives from 2,000 a week to eight. That's right, eight. And that's pinging the API four times an hour across a thousand cameras. So before I hand it off to my colleague, Brett, who will actually walk, through, uh, walk you through a demo, um, I'd like to have Rob kind of jump in because uh, something like this, uh, implement the right way can be very powerful, but there are a number of different issues we have to kind of address related to architecture resiliency. Rob? Thank you, Michael. Um, so as you look at um, edge and what people don't understand about edge is it's really the edge of the network. It's not in the data center, it's out in the field. So as you architect a solution that focuses on edge intelligence, you need to start moving that compute into a more distributed architecture. So not everything can be distributed or sent back to the data center for analysis or to the cloud for analysis, the most rapid low latency way to process these images and these video streams is closer to the point of capture. So our focus area is on ruggedized edge, on resiliency, on redundancy and failover, the ability to truly operate an enterprise class edge environment, leveraging compute resources ruggedized and deployed at the edge. So that is our focus and over to you, Brett. All right, uh, let me bring my screen back up. Before we jump directly into the demo, I'll just bring one last slide up, maybe a quick architecture slide of, of what it is that uh, we put together. You talked about, uh, Rob, the ability to sort of discuss over a lunch meeting what we could put together. One of the things I want to point out is, is also the speed at which we put things together. Uh, Michael, you mentioned, you know, putting, you know, doing the first integration with, with Chooch in 18 hours. Yeah, there were there were a bunch, most of the hours were up front, you know, putting the the uh, the containers together and whatnot, but actually onboarding the uh, the messaging into the 
into the platform uh, and doing something with it, that was really just an hour or two. And so it really is, this whole thing came together quite quickly. This entire application was built in a couple of days. We do augment it from time to time with feedback from the various counties and, and alert California. Uh, but usually we spend an hour here and an hour there. So it is a rapid innovation platform to be able to put that together. Here's what the sort of architecture of this looks right, uh, like at the moment. Um, there is the thousand cameras that they talked about, each one taking images and storing them in the cloud. Vantic acts as the digital orchestration engine, the central nervous system, if you will, for all of that data. It orchestrates calling the various APIs to get those camera images. It deals with when those images aren't available, which happens sometimes as those feeds are, are not always available in, inside the storage mechanism. It orchestrates those and hands them off to the, the Chooch Generative AI model. The AI model returns those events to us in inference payloads, and we pass them through workflow. We've essentially developed a state machine that they pass through. They follow a basic notion of being open, active, positive identifications or false positives or otherwise. And we also, within the platform, also have not only the rapid no-code, low-code environment for building up the uh, uh, the backend applications, the streams, but we've also put the, the web and mobile layers together. And so with that, let's kind of jump into the application itself and we'll describe exactly what you can kind of see here. A um, couple things is that the application is basically showing us where all the latest detections are. Based on my settings, we'll determine what kind of alerts that I get. So for example, if I click on the settings here, you can see I've got various permissions in the system. I can pause the processing engine, determine what's active. But most importantly are these detection uh, notifications and whether or not I get notification on detections or if for some reason any part of the system stops processing. On the mobile device then, what that essentially means, and I'll kind of bring up my mobile here really quickly, is I get these sort of cent centers of alerts. You can see the last actually alert was about 28 minutes ago. And so we get these alerts and they appear in the uh, in the dashboard here. Now you can see we're actually looking at a thousand nine different cameras. We process those in a 15 minute loop. We can obviously go a lot faster, but that's all the applications requiring. And currently there are detection, detections across 28 cameras that account for 50 images. We also take in the camera information to determine the orientation of the camera. So we can display it on the map. These are all clickable, so you can drill directly into these or you can use the main navigational interface over here. So for example, if I just pick the last one on the list, uh, you see Tahama, if I click on that one, you can see that's a nice strong identification. Within the environment, you can basically look at the uh, image, you toggle the bounding box on or off, and go to full screen or, or uh, save the image off for uh, further looks at uh, by other individuals who might not have access to the system. This is pretty clearly a fire. And so what would happen here in this particular instance is a reviewer would come in and they'd click on either the review. Sometimes there are multiple images in here. So they either click on the review or review all button. The review button allows them to choose some basic information. So they choose a status. For example, they'd say this is a positive identification and what the identification was. Now the engine knows what it is. The engine already said it was smoke. But in those instances, the reviewer gets to make a final say. This is a critical point of, of having a human in the loop at this point as ruling out those kinds of identifications. As Michael mentioned, sometimes uh, smudges on the lens, cracks on the lens will look an awful lot like smoke. And while the engine does a really good job at filtering those out and they don't, those things are actually tagged as false positives and then fed back in a round trip engineering cycle back into the model so that Chooch can then regenerate the latest version of the model and have even better detection, although the detection is quite good already. So let's kind of come back a little bit. Um, let's take a look at a couple of other ones. Let's take a look at the first two in the list. These are the most recent detections. Uh, here's one in Napa County. You can see this actually, this looks like a crack lens, but if we look at where the detection is, let me blow that up full screen. We can see that this is interesting because you've got this nice sort of fog layer over here, but there is indeed a fire down here. If I toggle the bounding box, you can see there is a fire. So another nice strong detection. Let's take a look at the next one down in Nevada. We'll go ahead and click on that one. And again, we've got another nice strong detection. So the system's doing a really, really good job of identifying those fires and giving early warning and alerts. Now, once those detections are found, it actually moves through and goes into a positive identification status in which those things can be further triaged. They can be looked at in the main dashboard. So if I kind of switch over my filtering and view, 
to positive identification. And we can see all the ones that have been actually flagged by the, by the review team. So for example, I'll click on this one that has three different uh, detections. And you can kind of cycle through the detections and indeed see that these are indeed smoke. Those cameras even move from time to time but the, the engine is still able to detect and pick it up. So the system allows us to sort of very rapidly, it's made very simple uh, and easy for the operators to use, to identify those detections and to feedback that loop so that they have a, a very strong chance of, of getting a, a positive outcome or reducing the amount of time that it takes to correlate or even cross-reference a, a known or existing fire, even from the time it's reported, say, for example, in 911. We also built a companion mobile application. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I showed you a little piece of it, but I'll, I'll open it up a little bit more and I'll kind of bring it up back here on the screen. Here's the mobile application. It gives pretty much all the same information. It's laid out just slightly differently, but it has all those same things and you can drill into it the exact same way. For each one of those detections, you can basically go through the same review process if necessary, if you have reviewer permission. You can even go ahead and open up a zoomable version of this so that you can, on the mobile device, which tends to be small, zoom in and give you much greater fidelity over what the system is doing. You also have the ability to run various filters. So for example, if I was just looking for things in say Sonoma County or something of that nature, you can just type that in and we'll go ahead and filter the list down below. There's nothing in Sonoma there. Let's go ahead and switch the state back to maybe um, positive identifications. And then it'll go ahead and filter that list down to just those things that are relative to Sonoma County. So you've got a complete companion mobile application and all of this put together in a short time within the collaboration between Chooch, Dell, and of course, Vantic. I think I'll stop the demonstration there. I've got a good amount of time for uh, Q&A and let me turn it back to the other presenters if they have anything else that they'd like to comment on or add. I would like to add a couple of things. As we as we worked on this project, I, I liked how collaborative it was. We had the team from Kern County, we had the the Vantic team, the Chooch team, the Dell team, and we we got together pretty much every other week and we talked about progress. We talked about how the UI needs to change to better adapt to the people who are are, are on the front lines and looking looking at fires in a fire operations center. Uh, we talked about the need for reducing the number of false positives because if there's too many false positives then the 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 fire staff loses loses trust in the system and they don't they don't rep, they don't uh, i would say react as well so once we got the false positives down to the right level uh that's where we got sort of the go ahead from 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 the fire chief that this was something that they felt would be valuable to them and without that collaboration we wouldn't have gotten this far uh, we needed that input. We need. We didn't understand what a controlled burn was and why that was going to be an important at certain times of the year. So it was that uh, I would say again that 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 group coming together uh, that allowed us to build something that we think is is quite valuable. Yeah, I think it's a, a really good point. There were other things that we learned from that collaborative effort as well. For example, oftentimes we saw that, uh, or at least early on uh, in the early detections, we would detect uh, smudges on the lens. Uh, as 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 smoke, but we actually learned that those smudges were valuable sources of information as well, because they can direct crews out to which cameras have crack lenses and which cameras uh, need cleaning and so forth, or, or various kinds of maintenance. And so there are a number of application updates that are coming that that address those issues, and that feedback loop is critical to to building good applications uh, over over the duration of the project. So I know we wanted to reserve some time for Q&A. Um, Melis, I think you're monitoring the, the Q&A area. I don't know if we have any questions that have come in from the audience yet, but we're excited to answer them. Yes, so I wanted to thank the three of you for your presentation for today. We really appreciate you speaking with us. Now we can get started on the Q&A. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and we will begin momentarily. So please ask us anything uh, that you'd like related to the topic of the, of the webinar, of course. Uh, we'd be happy to answer your questions and uh, look forward to it. While people are queuing up, I would like to one add additional comment on the back of our Brett's comments, and that is um, currently we're accessing the API every 15 minutes. We certainly can do that uh, more frequently. Uh, this is kind of our first uh, foray uh, into this, and we've been met with some really, really great feedback and, and great success. So pretty much product ready. Um, 
because fire had, takes all different shapes and sizes and, and yet smudges and cracks are somewhat static, um, we certainly can use this process to not only maintain cameras, but also detect pattern of life changes. So smoke will certainly shift over time. And if you kind of want to double click and, and, and double down on a potential event, if something was detected, we could certainly build subroutines then access to the API more frequently. Uh, and as a result, um, take even more um, kind of like work out of the uh, out of the flow, if you will, just to kind of uh, you know, ensure that what we're seeing is truly uh, an event that needs to be uh, addressed. So although we decided to take a 15 minute snapshot for the time being, uh, each area, uh, each uh, uh, department, uh, each state local government may have different sensitivities that may want to uh, customize the kind of uh, workflow here, which we're happy and able to do. Looks like we have some questions coming in. Yeah. So Melis, would you like to read them or? or you can go ahead and read them. So our yeah. first question is, are any U.S. national parks using the technology or is it primarily just the state of California? I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, right now, we're moving from pilot to production. So this project started about roughly six months ago uh, where we, we came together and we put something uh, in place, uh, primarily focused on the team from Kern County and on the team from Alert California. And the goal was to get it to a point where it became a viable solution. So now we're moving from this pilot program into more of a production model, uh, moving into more production environment, uh, allowing the, the teams from Kern County to access it within their fire operations center. So the answer is that it is now, I would say, ready to be used more broadly, either by national parks or other states, but the, the inception point was here in California. Okay, and our next question is, speaking of National Park Service, Forest Service, BLM lands, many are extremely remote with little to limited Wi-Fi. How does this work? Uh, I'll take that one. Um, this is actually a pretty uh, uh, important question. So, uh, and this is where edge computing actually uh, would play a very critical role. So even though you may be in calm denied or calm challenged areas, um, there is the ability to still run um, servers and cameras out in the field. And then by using uh, lower tech, uh, 2G, 3G, uh, even radio or satellite, still transmit that data to an operations center. Right now, we're currently only analyzing one image uh, every 15 minutes, which is a pretty low lift uh, in our generative AI engine, but an edge deployment would require some additional infrastructure where the insights, the AI would be running on the edge, uh, but where the, um, the actual insights and information would be then headed back towards some sort of central command or control center via satellite, radio, and other uh, types of uh, medium. And it seems like we have a follow-up question to the previous one. Seems like the system relies on a lot of cameras. And again, speaking of the NPS, BLM, and FS specifically, there are not a lot of cameras and many places are remote with high elevation with disrupt or blocked views. So uh, obviously you have to have a, a camera in order to gen generate an image, which can be processed by the AI engine. So there is a challenge of connectivity in remote areas. Uh, I think that um, if you look at some of the, the uh, the areas that are most fire prone, uh, getting a camera in place at the top of a mountain or at the top of a structure that can survey the surrounding area, I think is a is a key prerequisite for a solution like this. However, um, it's it's the connectivity options are growing, uh, whether that be satellite, whether that be RF frequencies. So the ability to deploy a camera and leverage the most modern connectivity technologies is is continuing to improve. Can this technology be used to protect areas overseas, or is it just limited to being used in the U.S.? Brett, you're up. pretty much anywhere. I mean, yeah, I mean, the the, the short answer is, and I think we have some uh, some interest overseas uh, in in Japan as well. So there's there's no limitation on where the technology can be used. What is the most common image capture device? How does the system work with drones? And are drones continuously monitoring the areas? So this is actually a fixed camera network uh, provided by a number of different sponsors, uh, both Cal Fire as well as a number of uh, utility companies here. Uh, and, and that actually has some merit because each of these have a coordinate and a field of view that can actually then 
uh, relayed back to uh, a responder, if you will. Uh, we are and can uh, run this certainly on drones. The question is, if you're going to be deploying, let's say, a 4K camera on a drone, do you want onboard processing? Or do you want the drone to kind of uh, transmit images, you know, every 10, five, you know, five minutes, et cetera, back to a ground station who will then do the processing? So uh, Rob touched upon a hybrid environments, right, where we can do compute on the edge or in the cloud or, you know, at a physical location. Uh, it's depending on, depending on the use case, uh, the area, the type of drone, the frequency, uh, all of these are, are possible. Wildland yeah. fire. Sorry, did you, were you going to continue? Well, I was going to say one of the things we've seen is some of the drones are now outfitted with 5G so that not only uh, they're they're producing telemetry information as to the GPS location, as well as the location of the as well as the image information. So all of that is is easily processed through that network uh, where there's obviously network capability in terms of location and in terms of uh, the images. So it's almost the exact same architecture that we showed you in the slide earlier only with the uh, drone part being mobile. Wildland fire in particular is rapidly changing and fast moving, especially in high winds and grassland events. How fast does it process the information? The, the, um, the processing is very fast. It's generally speaking in, 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 in milliseconds. Uh, but what we are doing is, as Michael mentioned, is we are going over a thousand, the, those thousand cameras, we grab the API call, and so every 15 minutes we walk through that list of a thousand cameras and then call that API again. Can we go much faster? Absolutely. The, the system is certainly designed to be able to take on much larger workloads, but right now we see that uh, the 15 minute uh, mark is uh, granular enough to do the type of detection that the fire departments are looking for. And the next question is a two-part question. The first part is, do you see any obstacles to translating the system to a difficult set of sensors? And then the second part is, did I hear correctly that the Chooch AI model trains on the limited false positive reports? Yes, we, we do have a feedback mechanism that basically takes any type of uh, feedback from uh, uh, fire researchers, fire chiefs that may detect a false positive and reincorporate that just to make the uh, models uh, more accurate. As far as other set of sensors, currently we're using, this is just visual, it's just computer vision. Uh, as Brett alluded to, the Vantec system is capable of taking any type of IoT sensor uh, that potentially can help complete uh, the common operating picture. Absolutely correct. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the strengths is the, the ease at, at which you can take the different streams of data and put them in. And so we see oftentimes the not only vision, but combine, combining that with uh, environmental sensors, so wind speed, direction, temperature, humidity, and so forth. And then also, especially in, in uh, emergency situations, combining that with vital information. So wearable devices, monitoring personnel, heart rate, uh, respiratory, uh, blood O2, and so forth, and combining all that data into a seamless orchestrated event. Do the cameras have to be hardwired? No, there's no, there's I mean, no limitation. Yeah, no. <laughs> that is correct. They can use any sort of connectivity technology. It doesn't have to be hardwired. And I know there's another question here about power. So if you can't run power out to a location, you may be able to set up a small solar panel, for example, and battery system to power the camera and communicate completely remotely without running necessarily power or internet to that location. And then the last- I saw, I saw, I saw a comment related to satellite and of course drone, right? Literally, if you can provide imagery through whatever medium to uh, and get it to the system, then we can run the AI. I mean, that's the, that's the whole issue. So if a camera happens to be fixed, that's great. If it comes from overhead imagery from a satellite, if it comes from a drone that runs, uh, uh, does a, a two mile run every half hour, uh, there are multiple options and ways to actually A, take that imagery and, and B, deliver it for processing. And we do have one last question. Are the system sections 508 compliant? Brett, do you want that one? Or you want me to take it? Um, I, I, if if by five hundred eight compliant, I think that's around um, uh, around accessibility. Yes. 
Yeah, um, they certainly can be made 508 compliant, um, uh, depending on the visual implementations, the web and mobile interfaces can all be made compliant. I don't believe in their current implementation, they necessarily have that approval at this moment in time. That was what I was gonna say, good job. <laughs> Right. I want to thank you and everyone for being with us this afternoon. I want to thank all of our participants who joined us today for a fantastic webinar. We hope this webinar is has been helpful for you and your organization.